Welcome to the final episode of Series 15. As usual, we have a few announcements. Yeah, the Acaticon Kickstarter wraps up in just a few days from the release of this episode on Wednesday, April 17th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that's this year in 2019 for those in the very far future. <laughs> As of recording, uh, they are just over $500 shy of funding. Uh, Acaticon is an absolutely amazing convention, everyone. Please consider backing it. Uh, even if you aren't able to attend, there are options for sponsorships, uh, like donating a game to the game library, uh, or even a table sponsorship where your project's name and logo will be on one of the gaming tables. And that one is only $25. So please help ensure that this great event can happen, and we hope to see you there. Definitely. It's my favorite con of the year. It's so good. It I'm, so, I'm so excited for it. Like I have Gen mm -hmm. Con first, but I'm still very excited for a Catacon. So. <laughs> they're, they're so close to funding. Just make it happen. <laughs> uh-huh. On a more personal note, we want to let everybody know what to expect from us for the next couple weeks. Um, for the next character evolution cast and for the next series of character creation cast, Ryan will be recording with guests without me. As some of you are aware, if you follow me on Twitter, I have had some pretty severe mental health problems and I work really hard to keep them under control so they don't interfere with my daily life or my commitments like this podcast, but that isn't always possible for me. This past winter, my symptoms became pretty unmanageable, and I finally decided to enter a two-week treatment program at the end of March. I'm happy to say that I'm doing much, much better, but I'm still recovering, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm really careful with my somewhat fragile recovery. Part of that, for me, is making sure that I'm not overextending myself. Because I wasn't feeling like myself for months, I wasn't able to put a lot of effort into working on this show, which means we don't have a backlog. Um, <laughs> Ryan has agreed to give me a little break for a few weeks while I recover and spend some time away. Mm -hmm. I also have vacation in there, so if you see my pictures from my vacation, don't be like, she's lying about her mental health. I also have a trip to Disney World, okay? <laughs> and it's good for my mental health. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I will be back soon, I promise. Mental health is a really tough thing that affects a lot of people. It's something that I try to be really, really open about, so I want to be open about it here. Um, mm -hmm. But you guys take care of yourselves and recognize that self-care is productive. It's okay to take time if you need to take some time. Um, producing a weekly show is a lot of work, and we mm -hmm. do our best to keep it going. I'm really proud of us. We have not missed a single week in over a year of doing this now. No, um, Ryan missed one week when he had a baby. <laughs> Um, yep. <laughs> I'm going to miss a couple of weeks now because I'm trying to just recover and let things happen. And also I have this mm -hmm. vacation. Um, but take care of yourselves. It's sometimes, honestly, you need to just say no and you need to say I can't right now. Because mm -hmm. um, if you don't do that in the short term, you may end up having that choice made for you in the long term. So, yep. um, yeah, that's where I will be. I'm sure Ryan will do wonderfully. I have full confidence in him. And yeah. I will be back soon. Yeah, I know we're going to miss you. Um, I've got some plans lined up for the, the next uh, about a month worth of episodes. Mm -hmm. um, so stay tuned for that. I think it'll be really great. Um, and I'm... I'm really looking forward to when you return, Amelia. And I know that uh, it, it's going to be a little different uh, vibe here without uh, <laughs> your your wonderful snark. Uh, it'll be cool to but, listen to the episodes not being on them, though. Like, I, it'll be a I know, new that, and exciting. <laughs> it, it, it is definitely a trip when uh, when you get to do that. So, um, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to when you return, and, and I can't wait for that. Yeah, you'll do a great so, job. Thanks. <laughs> uh, speaking of making us feel better, um, that's a segue. That is a segue. Nice uh, <laughs> job. I'm proud of you. <laughs> yeah. You, you could go ahead and leave uh, both of us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, that's going to be the best one because that'll help us out the most. Uh, but you can also leave one on Stitcher or Podchaser or even Facebook if you'd like. And we'd both be overjoyed at the review, but we'd also read it on the air, uh, like this one from Galican from 
the United States of America uh, using iTunes or Apple Podcasts for those in the know. <laughs> Titled Something for Every Gamer. This show does a fantastic job of showing just how broad the RPG space truly is. They've tackled all kinds of genres, as well as all kinds of different types of games. On top of that, the wonderful hosts always find a guest that is incredibly passionate about the hobby, and the banter back and forth does a great job of highlighting the game in question. Don't like the particular game? Just wait a few episodes and they'll be doing something completely different. So great show format, great info, great hosts. What's not to like? What a oh, good question. You, what is not to like? What Literally not nothing. To like? <laughs> Literally nothing. There is nothing to not like. Uh huh. <laughs> Thank you, Galligan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's get to the episode. Yeah, enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a group of characters for Iron Edda Accelerated. This episode we are going to be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Tracy Barnett, the designer of Iron Edda Accelerated. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone again and tell us a little bit about the character you made? Have you ever had anyone say no to that question? Yes, you know, they get up and walk away <laughs> and then we can't release the episode and everything's ruined. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will not say no to that okay. question. Um, I am Tracy Barnett. I am uh, a non-binary, genderqueer uh, game designer. My pronouns are they and them. Uh, I wrote this uh, game that I think is a pretty good one. And um, the character that I made for it is named uh, Lothar Loki's Baron. And Lothar is a seer. Uh, whose high concept is absolute power, absolutely. Whose trouble is that I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, who is a member of the wolf clan, whose aspect is the pack is all. Uh, my sacred item is an iron banded stone staff. Uh, and it actually follows the outline. Uh, my group aspect is to Amelia's character, uh, Gunleaf. And I gave Gunleaf her rune. Ooh. <laughs> awesome. Amelia, why don't you tell us about your character? My character is Gunleaf Jarlsbairn. Um, my high concept was hot-headed eldest child of the Jarl. And my trouble was power hungry. Uh, I picked the clan dragon. So the, um, what is it? The aspect, sorry. Aspect, that's mm -hmm. the word. Uh, rage is all the warmth we need. And my sacred item is my rune, which is uh, the rune of Thorasaz, uh, which is uh, destruction and change. Yes, mm -hmm. and my my um, group aspect is um, Seppa is someone I can use to gain power. Ryan, mm -hmm. do you want to tell everybody about Seppa? Yes. Yeah, so Seppa, oh my goodness, Vegeta's daughter. Mm -hmm. um is a bone bonded um wasn't always a bone bonded um she is one of the five bone bonded that were effectively um recruited by the previous five um to defend the uh the whole fast um and her high concept is we'll do whatever it takes to protect my family and her trouble is uh, I live in the moment. Uh, that means I try not to think about my consequences of my actions. <laughs> um, and? <laughs> my giant bond is forbidden love. Uh, <laughs> <The way you laughs> oh, Ryan. 
Um, so yeah, my, my character fell in love, uh, with her giant that's inside her and, uh, her giant fell in love with, uh, Sefa. So that's fun. Um, and my character's sacred item is a silver locket with my mother's likeness inside. And my group bond is, uh, Lothar reminds me of my failure as a wolf because I used to be part of the wolf clan. We also want to talk about our holdfasts that we made, yes, uh, which has a lot of stuff going on, and none of it is going to cause problems, I'm sure. Oh, it's fine. Uh, yeah, so the holdfast is Baneborg, uh, which roughly translated means uh, City of Bone. Um, and I have the, the notes here. We have a bridge on the verge of collapse. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the bridge goes, the iron mines will be cut off. And to even fix the bridge, we have to get more iron ore into the hold fast. But if another cart goes over the bridge, it's going to go. Yep. So that's a problem. Yep. Um, we have a clan, uh, one of the nine, who lost the blessing of the gods. That was the clan of the dragon. My clan. Huh. Someone, yeah, someone belongs to the clan of the dragon. <laughs> um, the dragons destroyed uh, what we're calling the blessed place. It was unintentional. Oh, my God. Okay. So hold on. Someone with a rune of destruction. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. When we when we get uh-huh. to our fan fiction section, I have some thoughts. <laughs> uh, I imagine you might. <laughs> um, we have uh, the peat bogs that we use to power the forges um, are cut off by a seemingly inert dwarven destroyer, and without the peat to fire the forges, the blacksmiths can't forge. Uh, and then also, there was a relatively recent battle where there are the wreckage of dwarven automatons all around the holdfast. And we were attacked in such numbers because uh, we have multiple bone bonded. There were five to start with. Um, in fact, our holdfast is a stronghold for the clan of bone, which is a rule-breaking 10th clan <laughs> and the bone bonded won the battle because five more people took on the bone bond including our own seppa mm-hmm. all right Oof, so that's a lot <laughs> it is yeah. I, I love this place so much nothing's gonna go wrong it's so good uh-huh. oh my gosh <laughs> all right well let's go ahead and dive right into a segment we are calling d20 for your thoughts D20 for your thoughts. In this segment, we like to talk to our guests about their thoughts on character creation, um, the process, how it feels in the system compared to others. But first, we always like to ask people how they got into role-playing games in the first place. So I discovered D&D when I was probably eight years old. Um, it's, it's a story I've heard a bunch of times. Like I had a cousin come over who had the D&D red box and I read it. I never really played. I made a bunch of characters. We don't know uh, anything about I, that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the thing, though, is um, for all that I make games and make up stories now, I was a relatively unimaginative person for a long time uh, because it was easier to read what other people did. Like, I read a lot of fantasy novels, Mm -hmm. like a lot. I Mm -hmm. think I read The Hobbit in first grade. Um, Like, I loved that stuff, but I didn't make anything of my own. Because if you make something of your own, then someone can tell you it's not good. Mm. Mm. So why face that? Just do what other people tell you and, you know, move on. Um, So, like, I remember uh, convincing my mom to let me use the church's copier at 10 cents a page to make copies of the character sheet from the D and D red box. And then I would proceed to make characters who just had 18s and all of their stats. <laughs> I wouldn't bother rolling the dice. I just, I just write them all down. So like I made these very bland, only numbers based characters. Mm-hmm. That I never did anything with, um, didn't actually play D and D until I was 20. When third edition came out, I was working at, uh, the campus computer store and was playing a lot of the Baldur's gate PC game. And a coworker that I talked his ear off about the game uh, asked me if I wanted to play. So I, my first character was a half elf monk. Um, 
And uh, from there on, I played with that group of or permutations of it. We played all the way through D&D 3rd Edition and 3.5. Um, I didn't GM for the first time until 4th Edition D&D came out, uh, which I loved. Um, I loved running games, and 4th Edition was actually a really easy game to prep for. Mm-hmm. Um, then that group fell apart, and I played more D&D 3.5 and played Pathfinder, and I discovered non D20 games in like 2009 or so. Mm-hmm. The first one was Savage Worlds. And then it just sort of went from there. Um, I didn't expect to ever design a game until I did on a car ride home from visiting <laughs> friends in Kansas City. Um, and as soon as I wrote that first game, which was the first game I published, it was uh, School Days, uh, it was like a switch flipped and I can't unswitch it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, which was weird for a while because I was someone who was uncreative. Like I never had enough confidence in myself to make a thing that was wholly mine. Um, And now it's all that I want to do. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So it really infects you. It does. I want to ask you though, like what was the difference the first time you played a non D20 system? Because you'd been playing those for so long. Um, yeah, so that first happened at the Origins Game Fair in 2010 or 11. I forget which. Um, but I went there and I bought tickets to a bunch of games that just sounded interesting. Um, and I listened to people play Savage Worlds on a podcast before I actually discovered anything else. Mm-hmm. So I was playing fourth edition. I couldn't play often enough. My group had dissolved and the Penny Arcade guys had started doing what became Acquisitions Incorporated, like the very first games they ever played. And I ran through their series Mm -hmm. um, on podcast form and I was like, well, I need to find something else. So I found this podcast called Gamers Haven, which is not uh, around any longer, but they posted four hour long unedited game sessions. (laughs) Some yeah. people love it. I mean, um, I think I know a couple of people that listen to things like that. And like I, even like Twitch streaming and stuff. It's mm-hmm. some people love it. It's not for me because my ADHD is just like too much for that. Um, right. But some people are totally cool with that. Mm-hmm. And and I needed it at the time. Right. Because I had an itch to mm-hmm. game. So I listened to them play uh, Deadlands Reloaded. It had just come out. And I was like, oh, man, there are other I I. I literally knew the only other game that I knew that, that existed at the time was Vampire. Mm-hmm. Those are like the two that everybody, I, they're like, did you start with D&D mm-hmm. or Vampire? <laughs> I had no actual knowledge of any other game system at all. I was a tiny little game. <laughs> and, and I listened to them play Deadlands and I really liked the style of it. I liked what they were doing mechanically, the idea of, of Benny's of a token, a player could spend to influence the narrative, the narrative Mm -hmm. was like novel to me. Um, I listened to the same groups play Pathfinder and other games, and they always used hero points. Um, they used a, a homebrewed mechanic called the luck roll where you'd regardless of system roll three D six and sixes were good luck and ones were bad luck to like, just figure out, Oh, on a random chance that's not tied to the D20 or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm. Um, so that inspired me to want to try other stuff. So at that that Origins where I went and played a bunch of different stuff, I played one other very genre different D20 game. I played uh, Delta Green. I played the original Call of Cthulhu. I played um, All Flesh Must Be Eaten which is a zombie game mm-hmm. where I got to play the one and only Richard B. Riddick <laughs> in a sci-fi mashup. Like we're on a prison planet. Riddick's a prisoner and other people were playing people from other sci-fi oh, movies. Mm-hmm. That's so good. Uh-huh. I got to, wow. th- there's a, there's a mechanic in, in that game where if you take, it might have been just a Riddick thing. Like once once per game, if you take damage that would otherwise kill you, you survive it and you come back into the scene. Mm. And they'd fitted me with an explosive collar so I couldn't, you know, run away and do Riddick things. Um, and we were on this elevator and I 
jumped off the elevator and got far enough away from the person with the controller that the shock collar exploded, but then I triggered that ability where I survive it. (laughs) (laughs) It was great. Um, And uh, I played a game called Cthulhu Tech. It was was a lot of Call of Cthulhu heavy stuff because I'd heard a lot about Cthulhu Mythos stuff for the first Mm -hmm. time, not too long from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I found out that I could pick up game mechanics and how they worked for me pretty easily. Um, I had a, a background in community theater, so I'd had some acting experience, Mm -hmm. very small town, like nothing, nothing major, but I, I could ham it up. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I found myself, you know, sliding into these roles and riffing off of other people and it went pretty well. Like I was excited to learn that there were other things and I started just exploring more games at conventions that I went to. Um, my first run in with like indie RPGs was origins of, tw- I know it was 2012 um, because that's the year I let me- I met Lenny Balsera. Um, <laughs> L- Lenny Balsera is, uh, was one of the lead designers on fake core. Uh, great game developer uh, and a very interesting person as well. And I was at games on demand, which it was like maybe the second year they'd ever done mm-hmm. it. So it was very sparsely attended and you didn't even have to like, be on the schedule. You could just show up and claim a table and put your name down. So I was like, okay, I'm going to run either Savage Worlds or Dungeons and Dragons, not getting that it was indie games on demand. Um, And no one came to my table. And Lenny walked up with um, uh, another game designer, uh, Jeremy Keller. And he was like, well, I mean, it seems like no one's coming. Do you want to play this game called Fiasco? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, that sounds fine. Um, so we played the Dragon Slayers playset, and the content that came out of our mouths <laughs> during that that two hours that we were playing, we looked at each other when we were done, when we had wrapped up the story, and we swore to each other that we were never going to reveal the actual details of that session to anyone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um we all had a really good time, but we all found ourselves saying and doing things that were abhorrent because the idea of dragon slayers is you are the people who just came back to the village after killing the dragon. Mm. And so you're the, you're the big, you know, don't mess with me heroes. Yeah. And we were all living that up. Um, I fortunately do not remember enough of the details that were I even tempted, I couldn't tell you what actually had happened. I just remember the fact. <laughs> it um, really worked very well. So uh-huh. Yes. Um, so that was 2012. I was working on campaign setting stuff of my own. Um, I discovered Fate. Uh, like I think that year was when Morgan ran Fate for me at Gen Con because Lenny said, hey, you have to play Fate sometime because obviously he did. <laughs> um, and then it was... Uh, literally either New Year's Day or the day after 2013, no, 2012, when I was uh, driving home from Kansas City visiting those friends, the, the Gamers Haven podcast, they were out in Kansas City. I became friends with them and actually helped manage a convention they started. <laughs> Holy <laughs> thing. Um, um, it, boundless enthusiasm will get you a long way <laughs> until it, it doesn't anymore. Um but on the way back from from visiting them, um, I started coming up with the idea for school days, and it just snowballed. Um, and if I hadn't taken a chance and tried other games, I never would have even thought twice about trying to make something like that. Yeah, I think that there's a light bulb that turns on for a lot of people when they try something mm-hmm. new outside of like the specific game that they... I don't want to say like grew up in, but, yeah. um, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't have that experience because I didn't start with D and D or, um, I did like D 20 modern and then shadow run and then L five R and then D and D for like three sessions. Um, and that's like <laughs> the extent of D and D that I've ever played. Um, but I know for a lot of people that's, you know, it, it's the gateway drug. Um, and so mm-hmm. I think a lot of people have that moment of, like, oh, these other things out here are so totally different and mm-hmm. can completely yeah. change the way you play. And I 
I love looking at the way that mechanics inform the kinds of stories that you can tell. I mean, and some of that came up with aspects and things like that, but um, mm-hmm. the way that the mechanics can kind of reinforce what you want people to do and like that that sort of wizardry mm-hmm. of design is like it eludes me but it's so cool to me like i can't mm-hmm. my brain doesn't work that way but like i love looking at it it's it's so interesting to me and i think the more games that you play the the easier that interaction is to see and like the the mm-hmm. more fun that you can have um playing around with that in your own games all right. Uh, well, can you go ahead and tell us then about your personal process uh, that you use uh, for picking and creating characters in any role-playing game system? Can I play a rogue or a bard? <laughs> <laughs> that is u- that's usually my starting point. Um, even if I am trying to play off type, I cannot keep my mouth shut mm-hmm. at the table. I try and use that to facilitate gameplay and and spotlight other other players um but like at a convention game if i'm sure you've you've been in those positions where like the table isn't really gelling around either the concept or the game or each other Mm -hmm. and sometimes a person just needs to say or do something Mm -hmm. to to tell the gm you've got someone on your side here like let's tell let's tell the story together and try and pull people in. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the one who will do a voice when no one else is. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's usually my default. Um, it's weird when I'm playing a D20 based game, I think probably because and I never even put this together until I was talking about how I used to make characters with all 18s. Uh, I usually think mechanics first. Mm-hmm. With D and I very rarely think about the character as person. Mm-hmm. Um, but with other systems, I very much think about the person first. Uh, I think it's just a byproduct of how I grew up looking at D and D. Yeah, as as a thing, um, or not looking at it. To be honest, like just you know, assuming stats were were the 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 be all end all. So, um, I I really. Yeah, I like characters that can can be the party face. I don't have a problem being that that person. Um, I don't have a problem being the person with a, a low charisma score or the one who shouldn't be talking but talks mm-hmm. anyway, as long as it's not disruptive. Um, I just like it, it's it's kind of that moment of inspiration thing with designing games. Like as other people are talking about what they want to play, because I do really like that process to be collaborative at least a little bit. Yes. <laughs> um, I I want to have some moment where I feel like I can contribute something to the group that will make everyone's experience better. Um, one that stands out to me is th- there was a game day. Um, I think it was even here in Columbus. Um, And there was someone at the table that I knew a little bit who hadn't played a whole lot of games in public. Like they were just kind of gun shy for all of their own very valid reasons. And we were playing Apocalypse World. It was the first time I'd played it. And I chose the driver. And I was playing a ton of Borderlands 2 at the time. I love that game. (laughs) I played so much of that game. So you can guess who my driver sounded like. Hey, y'all. <laughs> How y'all doing today? Oh, yep. I just channeled Scooter as hard as I could. <laughs> and this, the the player who was, who just didn't feel comfortable, like, buying in that much, it came up that our characters were going to be siblings. So I helped pull, pull them willingly into scenarios where they could voice themselves as the loud driver's sibling. Mm-hmm. Right, and gave them a platform to stand on mm-hmm. so they could play the character as much as they wanted to. Like, um, I'm not sure they'd be comfortable, so I haven't I haven't actually named them, but I'm still friends with this person. Um, and they've mentioned it before, and I, I don't say that to, like, call myself out as some, you know, great facilitator of inter-party, uh, interpersonal dynamics <laughs> at the game table. Um, but it was just a moment that sticks out as the thing I wanted to do anyway – I could do it in a way that helps support other people at the table. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just have to be me 
channeling a video game character. You yeah. Know? I think that a lot of times people need stuff like that too. They need sort of the invitation of someone else kind of goofing off or putting themselves out there to sort of set that precedent of like, this is okay. We are mm -hmm. like, we are all okay with this. It's not going to bother me if you do a weird voice because I've already done that. Like you've set the tone right. for things to say, here's, here's where we're all at. And I know that like the first time I went to a convention, I was super nervous to play because I'd never played mm -hmm. with people I didn't know before. That was the first foray into that. And Mm -hmm. I think for most of them, there was at least one other person that I knew, but like it was still felt really awkward and it took me a while to kind of get into that. And I think that can be really helpful to have somebody else there. That's like, like I said, setting that tone and setting that precedent of like, there's no judgment. We're just going to do, we're going to have fun. I'm having fun. You have fun too. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of why I try and bring a lot of energy when I'm setting up an Ionetta game, because I want people to read how I'm buying into it and get that permission from me as the GM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Well, I think that's the thing that a lot of GMs sort of have to do by default is because, you know, mm -hmm. as the sort of quote unquote, like person leading the game, you have mm -hmm. to get other people to buy in. And while it's helpful to have other players do that too, um, that's sort of the role that you take on as a GM is to kind of facilitate that mm -hmm. interaction. For sure. We are going to move into talking about this game in particular a little bit. How do you think that character creation in this game stacks up to some of those other games that you've played? I told I, I said before we started recording this that I was not going to be shy about um, my own love for my own game. I think it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there are a lot of games, including to an extent like Fate Core, that could use some of the structure that Ironetta Accelerated has to really get everyone bought in on the tone of the game, the feel of the game, mm -hmm. and and make sure that everyone is ready to do or to tell the kinds of stories that this game is designed to tell. Um, I, I, I've, I've seen so many groups of people from completely disparate backgrounds at conventions um, come into a game of Ironetta and start off not being sure what it is, hear the initial pitch, start making the hold fast, and by the time that's done and we're ready to go into character creation, they're bought in. Mm -hmm. They want to know what kinds of characters they can make. They want to make them. And that process at a con game, which is usually a four-hour slot, the whole thing with new players, including having to teach fate, that can take half your game slot. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those inst instances where character creation is play. Mm -hmm. And by the time we take a halfway break and we're ready to come back, people are like, yes, let us do this story. Yeah. That was right totally now, my right experience now, because I hadn't played any fate games. Um, I like... Norse mythology is not an area that I know very much about or had interacted with much. Um, a friend of mine was in the game and he said, hey, sign up for this time slot because I had nothing else booked that day. And he's like, play in this game with me. OK, sure. Why not? I don't know what it is. Um, and I had the most fun. Like, And again, by the time we had built our hold fast and had sort of connected all of our characters and we walked away to take like a five minute break and we were like, this, we're going to mess some stuff up and it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, and part of that is because of creating the hold fast and stuff like that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, any game that has world building in it, even yes. a little bit, I think sort of draws you in and makes you feel um, more connected and mm -hmm. more uh, bought into what you're doing. Because I think that's a hard thing to do with con games, especially is mm -hmm. to get people mm -hmm. invested, um, especially when you have like pre-gen characters and things like that. Yeah. And it's, I'm currently working on writing my first adventure uh, to run at Gen Con too. Yeah, and it's yeah. a thing mm -hmm. that I've thought a lot about is like, how can I bring in some of mm -hmm. those world building elements um, to try and have people have some interaction with the world and feel a little bit of investment because I think that really completely changes the tone of a game. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, collaborative world building. I'm I'm seeing it become more and more popular now. Uh, games like Good. Descent into Midnight. Um, this game, uh, the game that I'm working on, uh, also has a, a mandatory collaborative world building. You just got to do it because it's it's a magic bullet into mm-hmm. getting everybody invested because yes. everybody adds personal stakes into the world that you're creating, which makes your emotional connection to what you're doing just skyrocket compared to here's your pre-gen characters. This is the world we're playing in. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes to look things over so you can understand a little bit of what your character is. All right, now let's go. It also helps establish fictional norms Mm -hmm. for a table. I've had people at con games like give gonzo answers to the whole fast creation questions Mm -hmm. to where I've either had to rein them back in or I let them give their answer. And then before they're even making their characters, as they see everyone else answering, they get the idea that maybe they went in the wrong direction and that's not to quash anyone's fun. That's to make sure that as people at a table, we're all to a degree responsible for the experience that the other folks have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it helps maintain a set of fictional standards that we're all going to adhere to. You know, if, if two people in a row give Gonzo answers, well then that's the way the game Mm -hmm. is. That's that kind of game. If two people give, you know, answers in keeping with the fiction that I've presented with the pitch and I'm encouraging them and the third person gives something that's way out there, then that needs to be reined in a little bit, you know, because we we're all in this together. Yeah. Yeah. It already kind of builds that um, like you you are all collectively setting the tone for the game that you want to play and saying, Mm -hmm. here's, here's the sort of situation I want to play in. And I, the thing about collaborative world building too, is that I think the GM, it gives you so many different strings to pull on Mm -hmm. and so many things that you're like, okay, I can see what things are interesting to these players. Mm -hmm. I can tell like Mm -hmm. which direction they're kind of leaning and um, you can start to, you know, mentally think about those, you know, those threads that you want to pull as you, um, you know, pull apart their, their tapestry that Mm -hmm. they've built and just absolutely crumble all of their feelings and Mm -hmm. just hurt them very deeply. (laughs) Well, and and this, this transitions into the next question on the list. Um, the iron ed is set up is so procedural. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's that way on purpose. Um, one, it's because over the years, it's what I found works mm-hmm. to really get people on the same page. But two, um, it's a really good way of onboarding people into all of those expectations, right? It just, it reinforces that we're going to start with the hold fast to give everybody context. Mm-hmm. And from there, here are these destinies or archetypes and we can hook them into the things that you just made. Mm-hmm. And then to make sure you understand who your character is in the context of the world, more than just the high concept and the trouble are called out as named aspects, right? Everyone's part of a warrior clan, unless you're not Mm -hmm. specifically like the bone bonded. Everyone has a sacred item. Some are more specific than others, like the rune scribed. So it highlights where the common ground is like societally and calls out the aberrations. Mm -hmm that that you know transgress a little bit um so it it both speeds up the process of having to think about what it's going to be and what how what you're going to do and it adds more context to the entire conversation Mm -hmm. um yeah and and in fact with even with the other i mentioned um in uh, the previous episode about how the original kickstarter had stretch goals for a bunch of other systems um, and the only guidelines that I gave the prospective writers were, was that for it to be an Ironetta game, you had to have Ragnarok happening with the dwarves attacking in massive destroyers. Mm-hmm. You had to have Bone Bonded to fight them. There had to be nine warrior clans. And you had to generate something, a holdfast, a, a starship, whatever it is, with questions at the beginning. Mm-hmm. If you have those four things, you're playing Ironetta. I don't care what genre or what system. Nice. So, because this is the first slash only fate game that I've really interacted with, 
you don't it doesn't usually have like collaborative world building as part of it, does it? Or it very much does, okay. but it is it is a lot more broad. So so fate core. Let me back up a little bit. <laughs> the the first two real the first two fate games that really hit had setting baked into them. They're Spirit of the Century and the first Dresden Files okay. game. Um, so in those games, you would talk about the kind of game you wanted to play and you would um, talk about like the trappings of the established setting that you wanted to use, right? In Dresden, what city are you having this set in? So on and mm-hmm. so forth. Fate Core is a, a general toolkit. You can use it for anything that you want to try and use it for. And there's a whole section in that book about how to create the kind of game you want to create. And they give example text of fictional, fictional players using real designers names, um, going through that conversation about, okay, well, we want this kind of game. It's going to have this kind of magic and this level of intrigue and, you know, that sort of establishing conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's nothing to tent pole it, right? The way that, for what we're talking about, Ironetta has there. There isn't. There's nothing of an established setting to hang your hat on. Mm-hmm. So in Fate Core, you just have to have that conversation, and everyone has to decide these are the core tenets of our game. Basically, mm-hmm. then as you're creating characters, everyone makes their high concept. Everyone makes their trouble. Then you have a section where everyone, uh, because everyone gets spotlighted a little bit, and it's kind of loosely based on on comic book tropes you or or pulp novels because it's kind of the spirit of the century was like your indiana jones pulp action punching nazis kind of mm-hmm. thing um you would take an index card and you would write a brief synopsis of an adventure that you 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 had as a character okay. then you would pass that index card to another character and they would talk about how they were part of your story mm. of of this pulp novel you're doing mm-hmm. then you write your third aspect based on the outcome of that adventure. Okay. Then you do it again and pass the card to a different character Mm. and they feed in and that's your fourth aspect. And then you do that for the fifth one also. Um, It's a really neat way to do things. It's very involved. Mm -hmm. It is really good for a protracted session zero where you're all sitting down and you're like, yes, we're going to sit down. We're going to decide all the genre constraints of the, of the stories we want to tell. We're going to decide on the mechanical constraints of the stories we want to tell. We're going to start making our characters. We're going to write these adventures and feed into each other's stories as like guest stars. And then by the end, we have all these connections set up because everyone has an aspect related to an adventure where another character guest starred. Mm. It's cool. It also takes a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm not 100% of the mind that you need to be able to pick up and play a game in 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I want the process to build investment and build excitement for certain groups. Fate core will do that tip to toe, but most of my experience is running this at at conventions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find a way to demo the game that I loved and also set people up for play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of those different systems, typing all the aspects, doing the hold fast creation, all of those things bend you toward wanting to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like as soon as you're done with the characters, everyone can see the potential plot hooks. Mm-hmm. Everyone can see how their characters' goals align or don't. Right. And everyone, most of the time, wants to see what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. And it, one of the cool things is since you're doing it all collaboratively, you're actually creating bonds with these potential strangers that you've never met before. Mm-hmm. And now you have personalities of real people to actually engage with in the game instead of yeah, you, sitting down to blank slates. Yeah, you don't have to hand out a list of pre-generated characters and say, here's your cleric, here's your rogue, here's your fighter, here are their names, here are their stats. Um, and before D&D 5e, no flaws, bonds, personality traits, or ideals. You had nothing yeah. except the stats. Okay, well, my fighter has a low charisma. What does that mean for me right now? And a lot of DMs wouldn't like give you time to try and figure that out. Mm-hmm. 
it was okay. We have a session to get through. We got four hours. Let's go. And that's a valid form of play. Mm -hmm. That's some people's fun. It is not to my taste any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like we've kind of already covered the next question um, about Mm -hmm. expectations and stuff. Um, I mean, I think that it, it sets it up as something that is going to be collaborative, um, but also has all of those, you know, hooks for messing things up. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if that's the kind of game that you want to play, you can clearly set that up in character creation. Like we saw it in ours, that it's very clear that, you know, we're going to be at odds (laughs) sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and also I think that depending on how much of fate I have to teach to a group, Mm -hmm. Uh, I will either hand wave mechanics or try and simplify them or not over explain them because especially at a convention game, I want story to come first. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do a thing and in my mind, I'm like, okay, well technically it's this, this and that I try and boil all that down. So players can expect the story Mm -hmm. in a home game where we're going to take more time with this. I really like my players to understand the mechanics. So um, we'll go slower with that process. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's, I, I think, um, you know, just like a good general rule all around is like, know your audience and know, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, the constraints of what you're playing in. And I think convention games are particularly tough for that because you have such a tight window of time and it's so specific. Um, yeah. That you just have to sometimes do what you need to do to make the game happen in four hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's dive into every developer's favorite question. Yeah. What, what's, what do you think is the biggest flaw of character creation in this system? If you as a player sit down at the table and you ask the facilitator a question and you are not prepared to have the facilitator turn the question back on you and basically say, well, what do you think at any point in time? That's, that's sort of like the core of what this game does. Mm-hmm. The very first thing you have to do is sit down and answer a question about a world you know nothing about. Yeah. And it, it is one of those things that I have just accepted is the nature of this game. And I have developed ways to help like coach people through it and try and explain the process and make it as unscary and as easy as possible Mm -hmm. but there are always instances where i sit down at a convention even at indie games on demand um and tell people they have to come up with something Mm -hmm. on the fly and it is deer in the headlights it can be really daunting um you know mm -hmm. especially if you're a shy person or somebody who's not super confident in and especially Mm -hmm. i think in a game where you don't know the other people too, there's this question of like, well, is what I'm saying like really what everybody wants or like, you know, I I mean, are the Mm -hmm. things that I'm establishing stuff that other people are even interested in? And Mm -hmm. it's, it can feel really broad and daunting and scary and judgmental. I think if Mm -hmm. you don't have the right people kind of running it, or if you haven't set the right kind of tone. And I know that like, in your game, at least, I think you're really good about that kind of stuff of like when you ask that question and we're like, uh, you know, like you are pretty good at asking kind of not, I don't want to say like leading questions, but questions that sort of help you. That's exactly what they are. You know, I mean, that sounds like a, like a negative term in my head, but you know, questions to sort of help you kind of refine that answer because you're right in a world Mm -hmm. that you know nothing about. You're like, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about these dwarves and their dwarf Mm mechs. I don't know what that is. Like, Right. So, and and one of the things I, I do a bunch of things, I guess, at the table, especially for a convention game with, with a home game, it's easier, right? Everyone is supposedly on, on board. Mm -hmm. Like we all have an idea of what's going to go on here. Maybe we've skimmed the, skimmed the book. At least we're all in con games are harder. Mm -hmm. So I try and do a lot of things to make the table feel comfortable with the idea of what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't always work. Um, Sometimes it works really well. Um, And it, I guess the, the main takeaway I have is that it hit, 
it has worked well enough, often enough that I'm not going to change mm-hmm. it. Well, plus, um, I think the benefit of having that aha moment for somebody that's coming from like a D and D background or whatever background they've only played that game. They signed mm-hmm. up for this one because it sounded interesting, but they have no idea about any other types of systems or mechanics like that. When they come into a game like that and they are, well, what do you mean I can make up anything I want? And then, yeah. and then they do. And then it mm-hmm. clicks. So that's something that like I hadn't even thought about, about my experience with this game is like, this is the first time I had done anything with like collaborative world building Mm -hmm. because prior to that I had played D20 modern, which was like, I was like 16 and I think that our GM Mm -hmm. had decided everything ahead of time. Um, And then shadow run and then L five R, which clearly has like a very tight structured world that you, you do not make stuff up. Um, Mm -hmm. So this was the first time that I had sat down at a table and like, been like, well, what kind of game do you want to play? I was like, Oh, I get to, Okay, um, which, mm-hmm. I, like I said, can be really daunting because it's it's a big ask if you've never done it before, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and especially around people that you don't know. But it was it was a really cool moment of like, oh, I get to do what I want because this yeah. game hasn't already made all these decisions for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that so I I play D and D with my group. And we have a few players who don't know anything about the lore of the Forgotten Realms, Mm -hmm. right? And we have a few players that really, really do. And I see the players who don't run into the collective group knowledge and get frustrated or just turned off by it. Like, oh, it's a setting thing. And they start ignoring it because there's a lot of setting information that we bring to the table that may or may not be relevant to the story at hand, but we are sure geeking out about it. Mm -hmm. The three of us that, you know, know realms lore. And so I've found that if I have to make a choice between players knowing a bunch of information about a pre-written setting or being faced with having to come up with things about a setting that they don't know. I'll take the second one all day, every Mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the last thing I really want is to look at a player and tell them, no, what you just said was wrong. Right. Yeah, that doesn't feel good for you. It doesn't Mm -hmm. feel good for them. It's, it has potential like long-term repercussions, (laughs) I think. And so, so many people have had that experience. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Where they hear, so yeah, where they hear, you can't do that. Like, of all the people, like, I, at one point in time, I, I was playing uh, D&D with my sisters and their husbands and my cousins, because it's who was around and they were all willing to try. We had some really good campaigns. Mm-hmm. At one point in time, we, we invited my dad to play and made a character for him in the first scene. First thing he tried to do, went against the rules as written. And it was D and D, so in my and back then my mind had some hard and fast rules about what you can do. Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Oh, I can't do that. I'm done." And he got up and left. Mm. And like, I get it. Like looking back, I totally understand. Yeah. Why he why he didn't want to be part of that? Because the very first thing he tried to do, I told him no, mm-hmm. and his agency was gone. Yeah. So nope i I internalized that lesson hard. And I have to stop myself giving my players too much agency or leaning on them <laughs> too much to be a collective brain because mine is tired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, that, I've digressed enough about that. But yeah, well, I mean, but I think that it's a good I remember this Akatacon. I had an experience like that, too, though. We were playing Descent to Midnight and um, Richard Kritz Landry was running that one and at one point like we were going back and forth about something and we were like no i think it's this no i'm pretty sure it's this and i just watch him like lean back in his chair put his hands behind his head and just watch us mess everything up for ourselves and he's like i don't even have to do anything like i don't have to come up with an adventure i don't have to do anything you have just made the entire problem yourselves (laughs) like and it was a cool experience like yeah those are my favorite moments as a gm 
but you have to scaffold the players to get there. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's that's an educational term, blah blah blah. But you have to build people up to the point that they're willing to take risks on their own, and then when they reach out a little bit too far, you need to be there again to support them and make them feel level and good until they're ready to take those risks on their own. And if you're doing it right, you get that moment where all you have to do is just sit back and watch people interact in character. And then you're like, okay, this is, this is doing its job. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and con games of, of Ironetta, the way I run the games tends to be pretty procedural too, because there's, there's a formula for the session that tends to work for a one shot regardless of what the answers to the questions were Mm -hmm. because most of it just becomes trapping Mm -hmm. and it is point the characters at each other, have an engagement that shows off the mechanics and how to invoke aspects, right? Mm -hmm. Get some dice rolls in there uh, and have a big fight, Mm -hmm. have a Dwarven destroyer show up. Mm -hmm. Like in general, that is a formula that I can use for almost any session of iron. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't have to be like, your session at a catacomb, Amelia, I don't think was that. No, I don't think so. As you were the, saying that, I was like, oh, it's not like Grand yeah. Roll. <laughs> right. Um, but it all depends on how invested the group is and what's going on and how much I have to teach mechanics and, and where everyone is at mm-hmm. at a given time. Mm-hmm. If I can look at any one person at the table and ask, okay, it's this time of day. Where are you and what are you doing? And they can give me an answer. I'm good because then all I have to do is find out where the, where all five or six people are and point them at each other and they just do the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Iron Edda uses fate accelerated in this case. Can you tell me what it's like to design a game within an established mechanical system? Because I think that that is a very different design question than we ask other people um, in, in the mm-hmm. past when you're kind of like making your own mechanics and, you know, like that is a lot of the work of game design sometimes too. And so I'm interested in what it's like when you already have some of that framework. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to lead in close to the mic because I'm going to say this like it's a secret. It's so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> um, no, I mean, so even if you are doing a, a Powered by the Apocalypse game, mm-hmm. right? All that Powered by the Apocalypse gives you is a framework that says, okay, here's how your dice work. Mm-hmm. Seven to nine is not so hot. More than that's great. Less than that is, oh, um, and you need these archetypes to be to do specific things like making moves in Powered by the Apocalypse is really hard. And it is just, it is almost like, doing your own system from scratch because there's a lot of work that goes into mm-hmm. it. Um, and I know uh, your, uh, Ryan, your game is PBTA, is. right? Chimera. Yeah. Um, so you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like you have to, you have to decide how the fiction is going to flow from the moves and how the, the facilitator is going to respond with their hard moves mm-hmm. for mm, anywhere from six to 12 archetypes. Every, system that exists in an established way that if you say, yes, I'm going to use D and D five E for example, offers and affords certain things that will come easily and certain things that will be more difficult to express whatever it is you're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Um, using fake core for war of metal on bone, the original incarnation of, of all of this that I published felt like an easy fit because fate sort of sung to me. And as I was, talking and thinking about how these things would work it all just clicked didn't hurt that the stretch goal that i was writing for for the original original incarnation of this was fate so i had to mm-hmm. <laughs> but it turned out that it was a good fit um and then when things finally clicked during your session at a catacomb amelia when i was like okay this is how this game is different from War of Metal and Bone. This is how Iron Ed Accelerated runs. Mm-hmm. Like that, I got the give and take of marking a condition box and then having to recover it and dealing with it, those consequences in a much more prescribed way. So whenever I'm thinking about a design 
I will start mentally cycling through the different systems that I already know Mm -hmm. and going, is this a fit? Is this a fit? Is this a fit? Oh, I want this bit from this thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And if it's not already a fit, I just start cobbling things together and I'm like, okay, well now I have a a new thing. Um, But that's like years of practice. Like I sometimes forget that I've been doing this for seven years (laughs) because it doesn't always feel like it Mm -hmm. because my life has changed so much around all of it and I continually feel like I'm getting better at things. So every design is a new a new thing that might as well have sprung fully formed from my forehead. Um so writing Iron Edit Accelerated um was a lot easier than uh doing a lot of the other design work that I've done, with one notable exception. And this is a fate thing. It's a it's a Tracy and Fate thing. <laughs> Writing stunts for fate is hard. Well, let me back that up a little bit. Writing interesting stunts for fate is hard because fate accelerated as written. The core game fate accelerated is like, it's a little chat book. That's like maybe 34 pages long Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it has a formula for how to write stunts. I think I rattled it off in the previous episode. It's because I blah name of the stunt. I get a plus two when I blah approach Mm -hmm. in blah circumstance, Mm -hmm. right? So it's that, or it's because I blah once per session, I can blah. Mm -hmm. Those are the two formulae. If all of your stunts are written that way, it is so boring. Yeah. So you have to have stunts that interact with conditions. You have to have stunts that mark condition boxes and coming up with those things can be really, really challenging because you're trying to anticipate actions players will take during play Mm -hmm. and that you will, that they will want to have a stunt there for. So more often than not, I make up stunts on the fly when I'm in the play testing or planning phases, like I'll play a session and then, Oh, here's this circumstance. This stunt seems to fit. Mm -hmm. So like all, almost all of the shield bearer was actually written by Brian Engard. Mm -hmm who is another really, really good fate designer. I took a day, a weekend trip down to visit he, uh, he and his wife in Louisville and we played a session and I was like, well, I've got this concept for a shield bearer, but I don't quite know what to do with it. He's like, okay. And just started writing because fresh mind, fresh, you know, mm-hmm. I'm like, I've got the core bit, but he like wrote five or six stunts mm-hmm. for that character because in context, they all made sense. Yeah. And that's what that became. So stunts and fate are difficult for me. So they are my least favorite part of writing a fate <laughs> game. So do you like when you're first play testing it, do you start with like some of the formulaic ones and then kind of see what people do and replace them as you go? Or do you just like leave it blank and kind of figure it out? Well, that's a really, that's a really interesting question because the, this is the first fate accelerated game that I've written using this framework. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I'm working on another one called Valkyries uh, for Galileo Games, which um, the idea is that everyone plays a Valkyrie and it's very heavily inspired by Borderlands 2. So Still a great game. I think you'll be on, yep, you'll be on board, Amelia. Um, and the idea is that you're not just going to play a Valkyrie, you're going to play a named Valkyrie where your high concept and your trouble are already defined. Okay. Much like you would pick the soldier in Borderlands Mm. 2, right? But the Valkyries have woken up in a galaxy some 500 years removed from the conflict they were trained for. And they are way more powerful than anything else around them. Mm. They can do violence like breathing. Because that's not interesting to me. Like, how powerful are you? How much can you hurt someone is not an interesting question to Mm -hmm. me. The interesting question is when you can hurt someone with prejudice, how do you handle yourself when you're supposed to be someone who helps communities and you can kill like exhaling? Mm -hmm. What do you do? So all of the stats in that game, your approaches won't be determined by static things because Valkyries are very fluid. Mm -hmm. They are going to be the gear that you have. Those are all going to be represented by cards. Mm -hmm. And you can swap those in and out, but a lot of those cards are going to be stunts because that's how you do interesting things. Mm. So every archetype will have 
certain conditions that they can do certain things, convince people or heal people or phase through reality or set up a shield or whatever it is. You know, that means you have to write more stunts, right? But that means I have to write more stunts. (laughs) Why would you do that to yourself? Um, Because it's what the game needs. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's where, it's where the editor brain in me isn't just shut off. It's non-existent. Mm -hmm. Because in the different modes of creativity required to bring a product to, to full, you know, final state, I can't be that right now. If I try and self edit now, I'll never finish mm-hmm. it. What I need right now is the brazen, ridiculous creative side that doesn't care about constraints of production or editing or anything. There are no bad ideas in brainstorming. <laughs> exactly. I just need to get it done. Mm-hmm. This part of my brain needs to finish the game. I have a draft due by the end of June. That has to get done. I have to, as I mentioned in a previous recording, for a freelance assignment, I have to write 8,000 words in two days. So I need to figure out how to do that. (laughs) And it's what the situation, what the game demands. Once that's done, then I switch hats. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And I can look at it critically and go, okay, in play, how does this function? In you know, in this context, how does this work? Are all of these stunts actually is, is swapping things in and out like this going to be functional? Mm-hmm. I won't know until I try it, mm-hmm. and it won't have been wasted work because I will never have known if I hadn't mm-hmm. done it. Yeah. So it, it's it's like writing drafts of a novel. None of those drafts are wasted. They got you to where you needed to get to to finish the book. Right. But you still have to write a lot of stunts. So you did that to yourself. Yeah, and and, and, <laughs> and so future Tracy, <laughs> when you listen to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because there will come a time when I sit down and I and I go, oh, expletive, 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 turn the air blue in front of me. Why am I writing all of these expletive stunts? Uh-huh. Um, but... Here's the other part. I'm probably better at writing stunts now than I was a year ago. Mm-hmm. And you will be even better after this. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. So um, what was hard for me before is not always necessarily going to be hard for me in the future. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to write a game with a lot of stunts. There you go. I guess. Well, it's too late now. <laughs> I believe in you. Oh, thank you. Well, we kind of went over... Our next question that we had typed up prior to our conversation, um, we had a question about talking about the setting of the game and why you chose Norse mythology. Uh, it mm-hmm. seems that Skyrim had a very big role in that decision. Very much. Definitely. So let's just, uh, do we want to hop right into our fanfic? I do. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's, t- <laughs> let's, let's talk about these disaster children. Oh my oh. gosh, what a mess. Um, oh. So let's oh. talk about how we gel as a group um, first mechanically, but then also I want to talk about how we think this session would go. Um, so the group doesn't gel mechanically because in Iron Ironhead Accelerated, it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the beauty of fake games. Uh, and also the model that this uses is Dresden Files Accelerated, where... In the Dresden universe, there are people and beings of vastly different power levels Mm -hmm. because that's just who they are. Mm -hmm. Like if you are a practitioner, if you're a wizard who can cast magic, you are automatically so much more powerful than the clued in mortal who happens to know that magic exists. It's a conceit of the universe. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt that it was a useful conceit to port over to this game because... Sometimes you are a person who can summon the bones of a dead giant and stand toe to toe with a dwarven destroyer. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're a farmer. Right. <laughs> yep. And those people are no more or less important to the fabric of a, a community. So I wanted to see how mechanically they could all be represented and how they could all factor into the story. Mm-hmm. So, um, depending on context, each of us is the most powerful thing that'll happen in the game mm-hmm. yeah. mechanically. I love that. How would this mess play out? <laughs> um, so in terms of how how would this group fare in a typical session in this system? Um, they would be drama-filled messes. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm so uh, here that's, for it. Right? It's, it's really good. Um, <laughs> like, so 
I will only deign to speak about uh, Lothar because uh, they are the only person that I actually have the authority to speak about. Um, they've got all this power. They can literally manipulate fate. They can change someone's destiny. Um, they're going to try to do a lot of different things, and they're going to do it thinking that they're doing so for the greater good because, hey, the pack is all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? But like their trouble says, they have no idea what they're right. doing. <laughs> and the 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 butterfly effect of plucking on a string of fate is going to be so strong. The law of unintended consequences is going to come back and bite Lothar so hard. Mm-hmm. And I think it already has from the group aspect. Like, yeah. Gunleaf, the eldest child of the Jarl, is now a rune scribed, can never hold actual political power, and has the rune of destruction and change <laughs> brand er, embedded in metal on their forearm and it's that's that's Lothar's fault so many people will think it's Lothar's yeah. fault I think <laughs> so. that this process is how um, the blessed place was destroyed I think this is where that happened oh wow I think you're exactly right I think there's a flashback waiting to happen mm-hmm, yep. mm-hmm. Because I am Clan of the Dragon. So I think that, um, you know, it's it's a new toy and you got to try it out and see what happens. And um, it's a rune of destruction. So uh, I maybe destroyed the thing. Whoops. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think that tracks. Uh-huh. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? How are you feeling? Yours my, is just so complicated. My character's story, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um... <laughs> I think her main goal is I think I think she'll get to the point where she wants to keep her entire family together, which includes this new uh, giant. Are are you talking about building like a mutually consenting polycule with your yes. dead giant yes. with the voice in your <laughs> that's, head. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. With a voice in your head that manifests into a 30 foot mm-hmm. tall skeleton with you at its burning heart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm picturing whenever I, I summon those bones of this, uh, this is this dead giant who I am in love with. Um, it's such a like warm embracing feeling for her like the physical manifestation of this yeah this, this person that she's just so deep head over heels for it's like euphoric um, yeah it's euphoric uh, exactly um yeah because the giant's approach is compassion yeah what have you done to my brain? <laughs> That's what we're here for, lo- is to just I, mess it I up. I love it. Uh, oh, no, th- you didn't mess anything up. Like, that's the beautiful thing. If if we hadn't done this tonight, I would never have had anyone bring this perspective, mm-hmm. potentially. Mm-hmm. We love to do that. It's our favorite. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. <laughs> like, oh, look what we did. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, I... Oh. What are you doing over there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Dirt Stranglethorn turned I'm me editing into a... that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but now every, yeah. every character since then has had uh, some major flaws that I've attached to them that have made their story a little bit messy. Um, but I, I found a lot more joy now in that mess because of the like just over the top murdering and and stealing character that dirge is well because his family was eaten by a tyrannosaurus rex bred by his uh his his long lost lover yeah that he left at the altar because he wasn't ready to settle down yeah yeah we all we all know the story (laughs) (sighs) tales oral (laughs) time yes yeah ex-girlfriend's tyrannosaurus eats current family it's it's We've all been there. It, it's a trope <laughs> yeah. for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, so, I mean, I, none of this has touched on our iron mine yeah. at all. Oh, so, okay. So that is, that's the thing is that for the purposes of the fan fiction, mm-hmm. none of the hold fast hooks 
matter. Not really. Mm-hmm. They serve to provide a lot of context for character creation. Mm-hmm. But for what for what we're doing right now, you're doing the important work of what would happen in a session. Yeah. Yeah. By talking about what the characters would do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If if I if I step back from this and put on the GM's hat and someone else is is playing uh uh is playing Lothar, um I'm looking at what the characters connections to each other mm-hmm. are. I'm looking at the the bits of the holdfast we created and I'm seeing that the destruction of the blessed place is a, a capital T thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing that um, the clan of the bone inducting five more people, which by the hand, by the way, I've already named the original five, the right hand of the Jarl and the new five are now the left Ooh, hand of the Jarl. I like that. Um, and soon all and, that power will be mine. <laughs> right. And, and then the, uh, that destroyer sort of sitting out and blocking the peat bog connects to the blacksmiths and the forges, but like the iron mine taken as a whole, when you're in a hold fast with 10 bone bonded, you have an easy solution to the iron yeah. mine problem. Mm-hmm. You summon the bones, you walk there faster than anyone else can. You pick the carts up and you bring them back. Mm-hmm. Right. So like that action in and of itself and what happens with the bridge not as interesting mm-hmm. as how the blessed place and how the child of the Jarl having a, a rune now and a seer being responsible for mm-hmm. it. Cause who's, who says the seer also wasn't the one who did the five bone bonds, mm-hmm. right? Like there, these are questions that would be answered in play, but yeah. the things that, that center the characters are always going to be the most important and the Iron Mind does none of that. Mm-hmm. Right. So do you have sessions where, like, you have some of these questions and you build this hold fast and everything and then they just don't ever come up because yep. that's not the direction that the story goes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that, that doesn't mean, again, sort of like we, we were talking about with, with writing. It's not a wasted mm-hmm. answer. Mm-hmm. Because if the players are invested in exploring that element, they'll do yeah. it. A, a, a player will say... Well, I'm going to head over to and, and inspect the bridge. Then I go, okay, that's important to that player, mm-hmm. so I'm going to make sure it factors in. But most of the time, people will will see where the juicy story hooks mm-hmm. are and find ways to attach themselves to that. Mm-hmm. And I think that so, even though yeah. it's not something that we're super excited about as a story hook, I think it still informed things about mm-hmm. our holdfast too. Like mm-hmm. it determined that you know this the forges and things like that are something that are important to right yeah well-being. it it provided a shading and color mm-hmm. if nothing else right. and and those things are important too yeah. so all of the answers feed together to provide those kinds yeah. of things it al- it also seems like the the problem with the iron mine is more of a campaign problem Right. I mean, that's the mm-hmm. other thing, too, is that, you know, it's you can kind of start with one of these hooks and who knows, like maybe in the process of figuring out one of these other things, something points back that way or, mm-hmm. you know, um, I like games that start like that where you have like almost like info dump at the beginning and you have to like mm-hmm. dig through a little bit and figure out like what hooks you want to play with, because I think mm-hmm. it gives you lots of potential to as players like tie those things together for yourself, but also to just sort of pick which things are interesting. Yeah. And, and for long-term play, right? Like I would have the stress tracks for each of those story elements. And if the iron mine's not addressed, yeah, the bridge is going to get worse. Maybe someone tries to take a cart across it because the bone bonded are out there worrying about that destroyer. So no one's asked them to go to the iron mine. Mm -hmm. So some Yahoo gets it, you know, in their head to try and fix it. And the bridge collapses Right. Like Mm -hmm. these are all things that can happen. And suddenly an unaddressed story hook becomes a a real problem. Yeah. Well, right. Because then if you can't get the iron, then we don't have our livelihood. And then who knows what sort of uprising happens. And Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And and the world's always in motion. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I could see someone at a table that involves more than just the three of us joking that, um, oh, yeah, I wonder who sabotaged the bridge. 
GM brain goes, oh, someone totally did. Mm-hmm. And now I'm working that angle in my mind, mm-hmm. you know, for later sessions. So, um, I love when we ask, yeah. when you were in that situation where you ask a question of a GM and they go, well, it didn't before, but I'm writing it down now. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> my, my first thought I, was the, yeah. the seer uh, accidentally uh, broke the bridge with one of their threads. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Potentially. Totally. Because uh, success at a cost yeah. means that something happened someplace. Yeah. Somebody done did something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, the questions serve to provide context initially. They serve to, to make good story hooks, but not everyone's going to hook on to everything. And so sometimes things can sit. Sometimes they can be totally ignored. Yeah. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because you want to play the game that's interesting to you. And if that's not interesting, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's my gaming advice. If you uh-huh. don't want to do that, don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the system as a whole now, then. Um, what mm-hmm. do we think about how it plays and how it lends to character development? Like, how do you think characters change as people within the narrative of the game? So, well, <laughs> um, I think that fate lends itself to good character development because when you when your characters are in perilous situations and you take stress and you have to mark your in peril or your doomed conditions, you're writing aspects to go along with those things. Mm -hmm. There are are other things like you create aspects all the time as you create advantages, so on and so forth. And so as you change and adapt to the new circumstances, even as you level up, you get the option to change things around and outside of advancement, which I know we'll talk about in a second, Um, The group aspect changes every time uh, you hit a minor milestone, which is an advancement thing. Mm -hmm. So we get to look at the events that have recently happened, and we get to erase our group aspect and write new ones based on what's going on now or what has recently Mm -hmm. happened. So you get to reflect how your relationship – like it may not matter that I'm the one that gave uh, Amelia's character their rune. Mm -hmm. What may happen is that I had to save the bone bonded uh, from getting smashed by a dwarven destroyer. So now they owe me, mm-hmm. right? Like it. So the context keeps advancing and changing. Mm. And because of the way fate does advancement, you get an opportunity to reflect all of that mechanically too. Cool. So on that note, let's just jump right into our advancement portion and yeah. take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Still the worst pun ever, Ryan. I love it. Um, So in this one, we're going to talk about character advancement or leveling up, whatever you want to call it, and how it works in this system. So the first question is, how does a character level up in this game? And what sort of perks or changes or things like that do you get when that happens? So uh, fate in general... Uh, uses what are called milestones to track advancement. There's no experience or anything Mm -hmm. like that. Um, There are three different types. So uh, a minor milestone happens pretty much at the end of every game session. Mm -hmm. So because you usually accomplish some decent story stuff and you can make minor modifications. You can do one of the following. You can swap the rating of any two approaches. Mm -hmm. So if you want your flair to be higher and your focus to be lower, do that. Uh, You can rename any character aspect aside from your high concept. So you can change your trouble. You can alter your clan. You can change your sacred item. Um, You can swap one stunt for a different one. Uh, You can spend a refresh to purchase a new stunt if you have any refresh available. You you can have a minimum of one. Um, Or if your doomed condition is marked... Uh, and it has been recovery for a full session, you can clear it. Nice. Um, So you can have that back. Um, You don't have to do any of those, um, but those are your options. Okay. Um, A significant milestone uh, happens every two or three sessions of play. You can do all the minor milestone stuff, or you you can do one of those minor milestone things. You can also add plus one to an approach. Hmm. Or... You, if you have refresh available, you can choose a stunt from a different destiny. Oh, wow. Cool. And that sets you up for what happens in the major milestone. Um, 
it's every six or seven sessions. Um, you get one or all of these things. You get another point of refresh. You can immediately spend it on additional stun if you want to. Wow. You can change your character's high concept. Ooh. You can spend a point of refresh if you have them to take a new condition from another destiny. Oh, wow. So the bone bonded could get a rune. Mm -hmm. That's not dangerous. Right. <laughs> nope. Not at all. Um, or the seer could get a bone bond. Yeah. But the interesting thing, so keep this in mind, it's conditions. If you look at the bone bonded, bone bound and some of the bones are two separate conditions. Yeah. Oh, so you could be stuck with just the thing in your head. Uh-huh. Until you hit another major milestone and you can take some of the bones. Yeah. It also means that you don't have abomination or out of control. Yeah. So you would be limited on what you can do with the bones mm -hmm. because what you can do with some of the bones is contingent upon some of those other uh -huh. things. Yeah. So there's a lot of contingencies that come into play when you start crossing over destinies. That's really cool. Um, yeah. It's extremely neat. I've never played a game long enough to see all of that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, re I would really love to. Um, you can change your destiny entirely mm -hmm. and just rank them up based on the milestones you've gotten. Mm -hmm. um, or you can retire your character from play. Mm -hmm. Like if it's not interesting to play that character anymore, you know, what happened? You accidentally you? exploded. Yeah. <laughs> um, it happens. Um, and when you get the major milestone, you also get the significant and the minor. So every big milestone includes all the stuff from the smaller right. ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you really get to do a lot of different stuff, a lot of dynamic things for your character as the story advances. It's all contingent upon the story advancing, though. Yeah. Right? And those things, because fate is what it is, they all reflect the current narrative and they all have a mechanical impact. Mm-hmm. Even if you're just changing an aspect. Yeah. And I feel like so that it's, things it's can good. get really messy really fast there. Like, yeah. <laughs> especially for our, our disaster children, I feel uh -huh. like that could go so badly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I could see, um, get the name up here so I say it right. Uh, I could see Seppa, like, convincing Gunleaf and Lothar to both take bone bonds. Mm hmm. Because she loves it. She's she loves her giant. Yeah, <gasps> yeah that's and, been such and, a good experience I, for you in your yeah. And why why would why would this be bad? I can imagine because that some of the other bone bonds I would not some of them probably are a little vocal about how bad it can be. But And you and you've seen it. But mine's like fantastic. Why wouldn't you want mm -hmm. to try for even the chance of having the bliss that I have? Uh -huh. I just, yep. Man, I'd be unstoppable. I know, right? Well, plus the power. Yeah, come on. For sure. I'm do that. <laughs> yeah, power. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and what would happen then is, like for Gunleaf, if Gunleaf wanted a bone bond, we would get into the realm of writing conditions and writing new stunts. Mm -hmm. Because you're not just limited to what's in the book. Yeah. There are, there are guidelines for writing new conditions, for creating brand new destinies, mm -hmm. um, for all that stuff. For writing your so, own stunts so Tracy doesn't have to. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it can be really dynamic. Um, and it, it reflects the narrative, mm -hmm. which is my favorite part about most story, most, uh, most games. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I like when, um, when you're leveling up and things feel like like they're warranted, those changes are like reflective of what's happened. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I always go back to like, great, now I have a rank in the sailing skill. I've never even seen the sea. This doesn't make any sense. Like it doesn't, uh -huh. that's so frustrating to me. Like, why would I even want this? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I like when you have the ability to make those things match what you're, what's going on and feel important to you. Yeah the story and the character. Yeah. So it, it sounds to me, um, we need like to rewrite it, this question because it's the answer is always like, no. Yeah. It, it sounds to me like <laughs> it, it wouldn't be beneficial to have character advancement in mind during character creation because it's so open ended what you can do when you mm -hmm. advance. 
Yeah, unless you know that there's a stunt that you want to take that you can't take yet because you don't have the refresh. Yeah. Other than that, everything's story contingent. Mm-hmm. Well, even then, you can so, you can swap stunts, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, unless you know you wanted to have two stunts at the same time to oh, uh, true to combo something or or whatever you had in mind. Yeah. Um, which is all fine and good, but then you also have to make sure you angle the story that mm-hmm. way, and it it just yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for for a game like yeah. this. Yeah, I can I can kind of um, picture creating a character with aspirations to get some of the other conditions from other um mm-hmm. uh, uh, other character types and and then you'd be like well now i have to work towards that through my story and that's part of my character's story but it doesn't seem very beneficial yeah because it's not a third edition prestige yeah. class right like there are no prerequisites mm-hmm. right you just have to do it you just get there and and yeah, you have to you have to survive the story long enough to get there, and then if I'm running the game, especially, we're going to have a scene that describes what happens. Yeah. Like if someone takes on a bone bond during a game, you can bet your boots that I'm showing that on camera. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> hey guys, nothing different about me. Just bone bonded now. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Awesome. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Iron Ada Accelerated. This was awesome. You are you are very welcome. I was happy to this be here. This was so much fun. I, uh, oh, yeah. It I still love this game. Uh-huh. Update. Still love it. <laughs> <laughs> still well, good. Can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you and what sort of things you're working on? Uh, yeah, you can find me uh, online pretty much everywhere uh, with the other Tracy. That's T R A C Y. Uh, other Tracy, the other Tracy dot com is my website. Uh, it's my handle on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, I run an actual play podcast called The Other Cast. Um, we are adding a new show that uh, Kate Bowie and I are starting, where we're going to do world building by focusing on a snapshot of one given person in one given scene and then finding what's important in that scene and then doing episodes describing those things later on. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I write for Gnome Stew. I'm working on a game called Valkyries right now for Galileo Games. Uh, I have a small games anthology that I'm working on with a bunch of other really cool and awesome people. And I am uh, always making stuff for my Patreon. Uh, it's patreon.com slash Tracy Barnett. Um, I post a small game there every month uh, for $2 and up. Uh, there are Patreon or uh, uh, podcast outtakes for $5 and up uh, and more good stuff the higher you go. So that's me and where I am and what I'm doing. Well, thank you again for sitting down with us. This was so much fun. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. We will be back next week. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time.
Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like Total Party Kill. Total Party Kill is a weekly live Twitch stream where John Patrick Cohen, Eddie Klinker, and James Dugan play through Cephalofair Games' Gloomhaven. Join them in the stream to play along through the action and interact with a constantly changing cast of characters and special guests. Or watch them after the fact on the One Shot YouTube channel. TPK airs Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Time at twitch.tv slash one shot RPG. I heard about the octave drop on the outtakes. <laughs> I have now experienced the octave drop. It's serious. It's amazing. It is. That is wild. <laughs> I don't know why you don't do that more often in your life. Um, <laughs> I do it all okay, the time so, with my son. Um, sorry, I good. just need a moment here. That was very good. <laughs> I need to apologize, Ryan, because I hit the button and it didn't actually hit the button. So mine will what? be mine will be like it's like a one second behind. Fine. My, sin I can adjust my sincere it. apologies. No, that's fine. For all your effort. I'll, uh, I'll be able to uh, slide you around a little bit. Yeah, you can. I mean, with conversation, at least you can see pretty well where people are talking. Yeah. I've gotten yeah, better at it. Throw it all out. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, podcast over. That's it. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> baby bath water yes exactly uh, that's it we're done i give up <laughs> uh-huh uh at least i got to be here for the magnificent disillusion yes <laughs> you could say i was there when they broke up i, w I, I was, was the yoko was ono there. of this podcast I, oh <laughs> okay all right <laughs> sorry guys that's okay i'm gonna uh open another beer here real quick <laughs> Let's get it all out of the way. Do it all at once. Darn kids get me sick. I'm coughing in my eyes. Germ machines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's the right only thing the children eyes. are good at sharing. Uh huh. Is they're disgusting germs. Although my kids are not germ machines yet, but uh, probably oh. in a year, that's going to yep. change. Yep. Are they are they not in a uh, public setting with other kids yet? No. Uh, one's three and one's seven months. Yep. And uh, my mom, uh, my wife is a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, they they're home most of the time, and they're gonna hit daycare and probably uh, pre-K. They're gonna miss the first mm -hmm. like three weeks. You'll go yeah. for like two yeah. days, and then they're gonna miss the next three weeks. So bad. They're, yep, because they are walking into a petri. Their dish. immune yep. systems are great for at home. Mm -hmm. They don't get sick at all while they're at home. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I our house is probably like, I mean, because they're in elementary school. I work in a hospital. Like, yeah. it's probably real gross mm -hmm. in here. <laughs> yeah. We're immune to everything. Well, uh, clearly not, but close. <laughs> You're getting there one getting disease there. at a time. Yes. So close. <laughs> Optimism. <laughs> Soon I'll be unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a game concept. <laughs> Doesn't it? Are you good? I, this is so extra, but if you did a a, a different multi voiced thing for Let's Make a Place just for this episode, I might die. I'll have to uh, <laughs> I'll have to check with Marie Claire uh, see if she'll be up for doing that. Yeah, <laughs> you do not need to do that <laughs> at all, and this is not. Uh, I'm not actually asking you to do it. I'm just saying. you know what, Ryan, <laughs> you should do it with your voice. A little bit more than a month out, but do it with your do it with your clicky voice. <laughs> Uh, You're super low octave. Let's, let's make, make a, a place. place. Yes. Ooh. That's, it. That's it. Isolate that. Stick it in there. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Just jump a chorus effect on it. We'll be fine. Yeah, there you yes. go. Yes. Oh my gosh. And I have you say it too as well. So Please maybe I'll it. overlay them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Let's start. All right. And. It's going to take me a little bit longer to type this stuff out. The uh, My bottom row of, of letter keys on my keyboard only works half the time. Oh, oh no. On my laptop, yeah. I can so always I type it out, too, if you would, I, if that works better. Oh, it's, um, either way, um, I just left my keyboard downstairs, my wireless keyboard downstairs. Uh, so <laughs> B, and I've memorized the alt codes for all those letters. Uh, so I can actually just 
type them. It's weird. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the Iron Mo- Welcome to uh, World Wrangling. Nope. Uh, <laughs> what's the third W Come word? Come back to me. Come back to me. <laughs> Go workshop that. I'm trying workshop. To, yeah. I'm tr- workshop. <laughs> trying to draw a, uh, oh yeah, workshop. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. We, we solved the world's problems. Oh, I love that. That's very good. <laughs> Pete Boggs. I went to high school with him. Oh, nothing? No, nothing for my Pete Boggs joke? <laughs> <laughs> it was really bad. Um, I tell my children that I'm going to haunt them after I die. Mm-hmm. That's not scarring them for life at all. <laughs> no, not at all. So, for player, player, mm-hmm. player, uh, player. <laughs> Ooh. it's like the the <laughs> someone mispronouncing the main character of Clueless. Yeah. <laughs> player, get in here. <sighs> I can do this, you guys. I can read words. I'm eating jelly beans, you guys. I'm sorry. Uh, That's okay. I'm just typing and saying. That makes me want to go get gummy bears from downstairs. <laughs> oh, I love gummy bears. All right. So uh, l- let's go ahead and wrap this uh, this episode up mm-hmm. and then uh, take a quick break. Is everybody okay for doing the discussion portion? I am, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm good with that. All right. Okay. I just have to get my wife some water and uh, see what else she needs quick. And then uh, I'll be right back down. Uh, oh, after we do Closer. the uh, the closing, yeah, yeah, we should we should we should outro this bit. That's probably a good idea, and then <laughs> yes. we could probably stop the recording uh, and save these off as the character creation portions. Okay. Yeah, we'll start a new track for the other part. All right, so we'll edit this all together and make it sound perfectly seamless because we're professionals, mm-hmm. like we knew mm-hmm. what we were doing exactly. the whole time. No, unlike my seer. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike any of these people, uh-huh. really. Uh-huh. Ooh. Stopping my recording. Stopping my... Stopping my recording, three.